I'm, I'm also record. Okay, great. So, um, okay, well, so Nancy and everybody, thank you very, very much for uh, making time and for being accommodating with our schedules. I know that um, it was difficult to get everything scheduled and we had to cancel last week. So thank you for being accommodating. Um, from our side, um, my name is Dan Fee. Um, with me, as Bill Tambusi said, is Bill Tambusi and um, Gary Lesneski, um, who was the longtime in-house counsel for um, Cooper. Um, on the phone, we have Mike Critchley, um, and Bob Summer, and of course, George Norcross. Okay, and I'm Nancy Solomon, and I'm the reporter and host for uh, the podcast that we're discussing, uh, Dead End. And um, with on our side with us is Emily Botine, is the executive producer of the podcast and is a, the um, executive producer of WNYC Studios, which produces all of our on-demand audio. Uh, Lauren Cooperman is our in-house counsel, and so is Ivan Z uh, Zimmerman. Um, and Karen Frillman is our editor. And I think she's traveling, but listening uh, from her car as she arrives back from vacation. So Nancy, can I just ask a question? Um, when you say editor, do you mean like the sound editor or like the substance editor? Like substance. the newspaper has an editor, but podcasts have people who put it together as an editor. Yes, substance editor. Substance uh, the editor. people who put it together for us, we call them and mix engineers. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So if, if we can, you know, I, I think, you know, we, we'd like to sort of open up with a couple of questions, comments, concerns, and a little bit of some of the background so that we're all on the same page. Um, Mike, I, I know you wanted to, to yeah. kick things off, and then we'd like to have uh, Bill Tambusi take a little bit um, to walk through a little bit of the timeline as well. So, okay. yeah. Thank you again, Nancy. It's a welcome opportunity to meet with you again, have a conversation. And Nancy, in getting ready for this discussion today, I had the opportunity to view, you know, materials. Obviously, I listened to the podcast that had been out to date. I think there's three. I also reviewed, listened to some of the marketing interviews that you gave in connection with the podcast that are coming. And I read as many materials as I possibly could regarding this podcast. And one thing that struck me when I was going through the materials I come across the mission statement of uh, WNYC and New York Public Radio. And one thing that was interesting, it said the mission statement of WNYC is to make the mind more curious, which is interesting, to make the heart more open, and then to uh, make the spirit more joyful. And what I found particularly interesting for me is the mission statement that talks about making the mind more curious, because when I reviewed the materials and I listened to the podcast, my mind, in fact, did become curious. Let me tell you why my mind became curious. My mind became curious because I was concerned about the motive and content of the podcast as it relates to George Norcross and Philip Norcross. Let me tell you why I had that curious concern. I listened to, I think it's episode two, where you stated, based upon your experience, that you never tried to solve a murder, but you thought you might be able to crack this one. And the murder is about a New Jersey, as you identified, a New Jersey political murder. And when I heard that comment from you, a couple of things came to mind. I said, number one, that's an impressive statement for a journalist to indicate that she's going to solve a murder. And then I said, well, maybe not only is it impressive, on one hand, maybe it's an exaggerated sense of one's abilities, which is arrogant. And one thing I would never do is identify Nancy Solomon with the word arrogant. But then I was wondering, is it, merely, is it just clever speculation by a clever storyteller who you are? Because when you use your words, obviously words matter. And the thing I was concerned about made me curious is that in prior articles that you have written about George Norcross, I use the term, and you probably from your perch will disagree from my perch. I came to the conclusion that your speculation often about George Norcross 
has not been journalistically fair. And I use that term journalistic, journalistically fair and we'll use it later on. Because when I listen to the podcast, the podcast to me seems to be nothing more than the commercial enterprise that you see and hear from entities such as Hulu, Netflix, HBO on demand. And then I was wondering, is this commercial enterprise just that, a commercial enterprise camouflages as journalism? Because you produce it like a regular commercial enterprise, you market it as regular enterprise, and obviously you look to monetize the revenue that comes from this enterprise. And I know when I say that, I know your entity is a nonprofit, but it's a very large nonprofit. Last I looked at you have assets of over $100 million, and you're such a large, large enterprise that I saw one little notation, and I'll get to the point I want to make, is that your entity received one of the largest paycheck protection program grants in public media, $9 million. And the reason I say that is because, you know, you are a, a even, though, even though you're a nonprofit organization, you are a large behemoth. And my concern is that sometimes the content about a family tragedy, in our mind, trades on sensationalism, almost like a reality TV show. And the sensationalism obviously does what, what commercial marketers want to do. They want to click. They want to click, and they want to click for sensationalism, and that drives the, the broadcast in terms of marketing. Now, there's one piece that I have seen under your byline, which is dated April 26, 2002, and it's captioned, these are the key people in the John and Joyce Sheridan murder investigation. And what concerned me, because we're talking about in your caption in terms of how you identify this podcast, this is a political murder. And you identify 15 people as people who are the key people in this investigation. And of the 15 people and all the people involved, there's only one person that you involved or described in a political context involving a political murder. And the person you describe as George Norcross, which I thought was unfair, but was also unfair, I thought, Nancy, is that when you identify George Norcross, you embed in that description an article that you and Jeff Pellich wrote in May of 2019 about the New Jersey tax incentive program. And ironically, I know Jeff Pellich is not only a co-author with you on that, he's also a producer on this program. And then I followed up on these articles in your marketing materials where between the period of May 1, 2019 and July 2020, you wrote 12 articles about the tax incentive program identifying particularly George Norcross and people who associated with him. And of those 10, of those 12, 10 were joined by, again, Jeff Pillitz. And the reason I was concerned because I look at some of the things and how you handle it in the past regarding George Norcross in terms of being journalistically fair. And one again, one of the marketing pieces I have in front of me put out by your entity, you refer to an article and you refer, you reference to an article you and Jeff wrote and it's dated June 4th, 2019. And in that article, which is captioned, the, the caption of the article is, the tax break application had a false answer. Now the state has put the brakes on hold. And then the body describing it is the following. After WNYC and ProPublica identified a false answer on nuclear company Holtec International, New Jersey tax break application, state officials have frozen the break pending further investigation. Now, I have no problem with that article. But in terms of journalistically being fair as it pertains to George Norcross, because you focused at least two articles on Holtec in connection with George Norcross, you have the beginning of the article and you followed it for some period of time. But I note, and I didn't see it, you never followed up with the conclusion. And the conclusion to be journalistically fair is that the tax break that was frozen pursuant to, according to your marketing materials, your efforts, was heard by a judge in Mercer County, Judge Logie. And what Judge Logie found is, A, there were no false statements, no false statements at all by Holtec. Not only did he find there was no false statements, 
The only criticism the judge had was in the EDA questions that were submitted to Holtec. And then he, what he did, he ordered, he ordered the award to be granted to, to Holtec. Now, I didn't see any follow-up to that. I thought that was not fair as it pertained to George Norcross. And then two other articles towards the end of your string of articles, you, you say, you know, George Norcross is an entity are under investigation. Fair, they're under investigation. You said it a couple of times. But what I didn't find fair is that you never reported that after a year of investigations by both federal and state agencies and state regulators and the EDA, although you criticize it, never once did you report that after the EDA and all these regulators conducted an examination and quote, an investigation, every entity you talked about involving George Norcross was found to be appropriately awarded tax incentives. That's Cooper Hospital, that's NFI, that's Connor Strong Bucklew, and that's Michaels. And not only were they awarded, the judge awarded it in terms of, of uh, Holtec. I just found that not to be particularly, particularly fair. Uh, and that is something that bothered me. But let me tell you something that I found, in fairness, I found appropriate. And to use, again, the mission statement, when I read this comment from you, not only was I not only curious, but my spirit was made more joyful. I'm not being funny. This is a question you were asked. You used the question you were asked during an interview by David First on April 5, 22. The question he asked of you when you were discussing this podcast as it relates to George Norcross, this is what you said in response to his question. His question was the following. How is George Norcross connection to the story? Now, to me, that's the most, that is the most appropriate question that anyone could ask about this, quote, interview. And this is the answer you gave. And you gave it, let me give you the background. When you gave it, uh, you said the following. So, I haven't found any evidence that George Norcross had anything to do with the death of the Sheridans. Now, this is what you said. Now, this is after two years of investigation. I haven't found any evidence that George Norcross had anything to do with the deaths of the Sheridans. And I just want to say that up front because I don't want to be casting aspersions. Now, I found that very noble. And we all know what aspersions means, fraudulent, misleading statements, innuendos, intending to damage someone's reputation. Now, that was before I heard the podcast. Now, when I hear the podcast, we talk about George Norcross, now I'm talking about, I believe it's episode one. And for the record, you go to, I think somewhere around uh, 27 minutes and 30 seconds. And again, this is about being journalistically fair. You have an interview with um, John Farmer and he quotes in response to discussions with you. One month before he died, he told me he and George were not getting along. He didn't go into specifics about what the issues were he said, we are really not talking that much. He thought it was an odd situation. He didn't really confide and I never really pushed. And then right immediately thereafter, in terms of showing how this is not journalism, it's, a, it's a, really a commercial enterprise camouflaged as journalism. It's really for entertainment. What you say immediately, and when you say it and the production I get, I gotta give credit to production. You have Jared Paul, who's your musician, and mix engineer. He sets up the appropriate mood, mood music. And this is what you say, a very dramatic voice, right following that comment. And right two days before you said, George Norcross had, there's no evidence of him being involved in the Sheridan's member, uh, murder. You say, and the way you say it is very dramatic. So John Sheridan, the CEO of Cooper Hospital, wasn't talking much to his boss, the chairman of the board. And whatever that conflict was about, this, it was happening right before the Sheridans died. That's the tease. That's journalism being not fair. And the mood music then changes to bagpipes at a funeral. And what we're talking about is if you're going to be fair, make certain you emphasize that you have no evidence whatsoever that George Norcross had anything to do with the Sheridans, that the Sheridans uh, murder investigation, that tragedy, that tragedy. 
because the only thing I want to do is, I, I, and I don't want to get this to be adversary, because if anyone even suggests, intimates, or infers obliquely, directly, indirectly, that George Norcross was somehow involved in, in John Sheridan's and George Sheridan's tragic death, the next letter you receive from me is a litigation hold notice. And I just want to, it's, I just want to emphasize that. We, we are not someone who just throw around threatened. We're, we've been the subject of particular editorials and comments throughout, throughout the years, but no one ever, ever has suggested or inferred what you have done in that answer that George Norquist somehow is involved with the tragic death of Joyce and John Sheridan. And basically that's all, because I know the next thing I, I listened to an, an interview you gave in January of 2022, where you discussed the, the Cottle, the Cottle episode. And for some reason, you again interject George Norcross. Now, I don't know what the Cottle connection is that you're trying to draw, but that is sheer speculation. That's arbitrary, and to use your word, that's aspersion. To try and suggest that George is somehow involved with Cottle and, and, and this death, it's, it's, it's so arbitrary. It's like me trying to say, there are a lot of people who have committed fraud with the Paycheck, Paycheck Protection Program. WNYC received $9 million in Paycheck Protection Program monies. Therefore, they must be involved in fraud. That's an arbitrary statement. And I just want to say, I'm asking you, Nancy, to exercise your journalism and don't be blinded by the commercial product you're trying to sell. Make certain you please be journalistically fair and make certain that hopefully, you know, you do not suggest or imply that George Norcross in any way, shape or form was involved in the tragic death of John and Joyce Sheridan, because to do that is going to cross a point where we cannot tolerate and we will never tolerate. And Nancy, that's just what I wanted to tell you. Yes, we listened to your mission statement. We were curious. To some extent, we were joyful in the spirit because you said George Norcross has nothing to do with the John Sheridan murder, but then you saw how tease suggesting by way of speculation to make it a reality TV show, just to tease that he may be involved. And that tease, I assure you, will be casting aspersions and will be very damaging in the future to WNYC. And, and I thank you for taking the time to listen to me and Bill Tambusi will answer some questions if I have to, I'll join in. Thank you, Nancy. All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, Nancy, Emily, uh, I guess it's Lauren, Karen, and Ivan for being on the call. I, I wanna be a little bit more specific because uh, Nancy, as you know, your April 14th letters to George Norcross and Phil Norcross ultimately came to me and I provided a response. I'm not gonna go through all the things in that response, but there's a couple critical things and I I'm gonna start it because when I read your letter, I was struck by a couple things at the outset. Um, you, you indicated early on in the letter that you had interviews with people that John spoke with prior to, uh, in the month, during the months before he died. So I went to Cooper and I went and I asked people, I asked Gary Lesneski, I asked Adrian Kirby, I asked Dr. Mazzarelli, I asked Doug Shirley, I asked uh, then Dina Matthews, I asked the Cooper cardio doctors, had you spoken to Nancy Solomon or had she reached out to you before your April 14th letter? to get any information about John Sheridan and John Sheridan's state of mind in the month before he died. And they all said no. And that, that struck me as odd because these are the people that were working closest with John Sheridan and Gary Lesneski in particular. So then I went to your next paragraph in your first bullet point, And you said that you were surprised that John, people told you that they were surprised that John Sheridan went to work for you, meaning George Norcross, in his role as CEO of Cooper, because it was just months after news broke about the Palmyra tapes. That's just factually wrong. The Palmyra tapes case was filed after the tapes were released, and that was two years, two years prior to the discussions between John Sheridan and Dennis Coleman. The Gorel Rosenberg 
Palmyra Tapes case was filed in January of 2003. The tapes were released before the suit was filed. John Sheridan wasn't hired until July 2005. There's a two year gap there. And, and we know, and we know that you know now, after I gave you Dennis Colnan's phone number, that John Sheridan came to work at Cooper Hospital as an employee after approximately three years of service as a lobbyist to Cooper Hospital. So he was working for Cooper Hospital before, before he had a discussion with Dennis Coleman about becoming an employee at Cooper. Can, so, can I jump in and, and, and add something to this, please? Because sure. I, I think, you know, I don't know if the wording in the letter is clear, but what I was what I was intending to say is that it's, it was 2005 is when the Palmyra tapes became public, when the, the courts required the state to release those tapes. And so that's what I was talking about, not when the case was, you know, filed or ongoing earlier than that. And I would just like to say, I did reach out to Doug Shirley and um, Dr. Mazzarelli in 2019, um, and neither one of them uh, responded to my request for an interview. So there's that. Um, and um, there was one other thing you said about the, oh, and, and I was, I'm aware of, uh, John Sheridan having been uh, when he was at Riker Danzig that uh, Cooper Hospital was a client of his. I'm, uh, I'm not quite sure why that, uh, what your point is about that. Yeah, I mean, because you said that people were surprised that John Sheridan went to work for George Norcross in his role as CEO of Cooper Hospital because it was just months after news broke about the Palmyra tapes. Yeah. A reasonable reader of those words knows that you can look up when the Palmyra tapes became public and they came, became public years before the court ordered the release of the actual transcripts because Garral and Rosenberg released them to the press in 2002, okay, December of 2002. And, you know, to suggest that there was some surprise about John Sheridan to go to work shortly, just months after news broke about the Palmyra tapes. It's just false to the reader. It's not accurate. So then we continue on the timeline here. This is John Sheridan, a person who had impeccable reputation, who had contacts, who had a Rolodex back when people had Rolodexes, far greater than anyone in New Jersey. And he chose to solicit a job at Cooper. And he solicited that job through Dennis Coleman. I know you, you talked to Dennis the other day and he told you that John solicited the job through him. And then it was brought to George Norcross's attention. So it's not as though John didn't know what he was doing. John, in fact, knew exactly what his, he was doing. No, I don't, I don't think, yeah, I, I don't think I said that. Okay, so when we, we continue on here with, with this, this timeline, John Sheridan becomes, goes through a series of promotions and is promoted to uh, president of Cooper Hospital and CEO of Cooper Hospital in February 2008. In February of 2011, with the support of Cooper, he goes on the Cooper's Ferry Partnership Board. Selected treasurer then. Now, in January of 2012, things change operationally at Cooper at the highest level. And during this period of time, John is discussing with the Cooper board that he needs to transition out eventually. And Cooper needs to have a succession plan. And he recommends that Cooper seek out Adrian Kirby, who had been working um, at that time 
with a prominent hospital organization in Maryland. Um, Adrian Kirby's then hired in February, in January of 2012. In February of 2013, John Sheridan becomes the co-chair of Cooper's Ferry Partnership. Shortly thereafter, in May of 2013, Adrian Kirby becomes the president and CEO of Cooper University Hospital. This is important because at that time, at that time, Adrian Kirby then takes over the operational aspect of Cooper Hospital. So board leadership when they're discussing operational aspects are going to speak with the leadership of the operational aspects. And that is fully expected. Now Gary's gonna fill Gary's gonna follow me with you know what that meant in terms of internal operations at the hospital. But during that period of time when Adrian Kirby became the president and CEO of Cooper University Healthcare taking control of operations, John's role changed at the hospital. He retained his title. He retained his title, but his role changed. He became, <clears throat> excuse me, more focused on the activities within the city of Camden, more focused on the activities within the community, <clears throat> more focused on the governmental activities. Now, <clears throat> During this period of time, John knew that he had to file annual reports that would disclose any conflicts of interest that he had. And those reports stated that you don't wait until the conflict arises. You don't wait till the annual reports do if a conflict arises. You disclose the conflict when you become aware of it. In March, of 2014, Cooper, Cooper's Ferry sends a memo to John Sheridan regarding the fact that it doesn't have financing to acquire the L3 building, this building that we've talked about a little bit, and that they were trying to figure out a way to obtain the financing. John has a discussion with the folks at Cooper's Ferry. We have the memo. This was all disclosed in 2019. I reiterated part of it in my letter to you uh, a few weeks ago. But in that letter, it's clear that Cooper's Ferry can't do the deal, can't purchase the building. So what they do is they get John, unbeknownst to administrative leadership at Cooper Hospital, and Gary will tell you the impact of that, to agree to a long-term, above-market, non-equity interest lease in the L3 building so that Cooper's Ferry could obtain a finance. How did Cooper management and executive management and leadership find out about that? TD Bank called Cooper to ask Cooper if this lease arrangement was real. When it came to the attention of executive leadership and management, it was immediately reviewed and the issue of a conflict of interest was brought to John's attention. And John was told by me that he needed to recuse himself from this matter because he was in a conflict of interest. John Sheridan, in his annual report of conflicts on July 9th, 2014, disclosed the fact that this potential real estate transaction was a conflict of interest. He certified to that in July of 2014. Months, months before the events, the tragic events of September. Between that time and September, the beginning of September, there is no record of any communications 
or any issues that John raised with regard to that conflict of interest. He simply was recused from that matter and nothing went further on. Which really brings us then to the events that began in September. And I'm gonna throw those over to Gary Lesneski because he was closest to them and closer to those issues than I for certain, for sure. Um, and, and they're really the issues that were immediately on John's mind in September of 2014. <clears throat> Thanks folks. Um, so I was general counsel at that time. Um, and uh, I did interact with John at, on some of the projects he was doing. Uh, he was, as Bill mentioned, focused on a number of important issues for the hospital, relationships with the medical school, uh, relationships with other entities in Camden, such as the Coriolan Institute, uh, rehabilitation of neighborhoods. We were really very interested in, in, in helping in that respect. Um, we were also dealing with, with uh, certain issues pertaining to, to uh, uh, cardiology um, issues in New Jersey. And uh, the last, I would say, two or three weeks of time, he was engaging with me on a frequent basis with concerns about a couple of elements in that cardiology um, area. And um, there were really two things that we were focused on at the time. One was the question of, of what other hospitals would be able to do in the, uh, with, with angioplasty uh, that did not have full cardiac licenses. Cooper had a full cardiac license that, had, that they'd had for several years, uh, which gave Cooper the ability to do a wide, range, a wide array of cardiac procedures, including a, uh, angioplasties on both an emergent and a diagnostic uh, basis. Um, other hospitals in New Jersey have been given an opportunity in a demonstration project to do angioplasties on an emergent basis, but not a full array of, of procedures in that, in that area. Uh, there was some concern that um, the state was going to pr uh, promulgate a regulation that might permit a much wider uh, array of services to be performed by these other hospitals, which would have had a fairly significant negative impact on, on uh, inner city hospitals like Cooper uh, that, that uh, had a full uh, cardiac license. So there was some concern over that, a lot of concern over what would, what would that regulation be, whether uh, hospitals that were doing angioplasties under the demonstration project would have the opportunity to have a wider uh, array of activities without having to go through a full certificate of need review pro process. And we were in contact um, internally and with the, the, uh, the, the Department of Health uh, on, on this particular issue. I know that John was concerned uh, about uh, you know the impact on Cooper, concerned enough that he reached out to George uh, to have George see what he could find out in that regard. So there was definitely communication amongst the three of us at the time on that particular issue, as well as uh, another issue that had come up, which was the state was about to issue a, a periodic uh, cardiology mortality report on cardiac surgery uh, that uh, that was not uh, going to be particularly uh, positive from Cooper's uh, perspective. And um, that report was based on data that was several years old. Uh, so it was causing some real consternation in the organization, particularly with our cardiac surgeons who felt it was an unfair, uh, uh, an unfair uh, way to characterize our then current uh, cardiac surgery program. Uh, more than that, you know, it didn't take into account the fact that Cooper was the place where a lot of patients were transferred who had had perhaps not particularly satisfactory results in other institutions. And then if they came to us and we tried to take heroic actions to, to uh, intervene and they passed away in, in our institution, we were the ones who were getting charged with that mortality. So there were a lot of concerns. But but what was it, what was uh, particularly interesting to me at the time, and this is I think relevant to what you're uh, looking into is that you know, John was very, very uh, agitated about all this stuff. It was the only thing we talked about 
uh, during that two or three week period up until the time, up until probably around 6 p.m. of the Friday before he, uh, before the events occurred. Um, and I was having a hard time uh, reconciling his level of, of, of uh, upset with the, with the uh, situation with what I thought was more what the, really where the facts were and the like the consequences of, of what was going to happen in these two areas. And we spent a lot of time talking and I was trying to, to, to work with him to come up with a, a response, particularly the cardiac report. And in fact, we had decided at, at the close of business on Friday, he seemed to be um, much more um, um, confident in, in where we're, we're going with this. And uh, we scheduled a meeting for 2 p.m. on Sunday. We were going to come in on Sunday, um, meet with the cardiac surgeons uh, and our um, publicity folks and, and come up with a, a response to this likely report that was going to be issued. So from my perspective, this was all about cardiology all the time um, in those weeks prior to, to, to uh, his death. And, uh, but I thought we were in a pretty good place, a pretty solid place when he left Friday. And, and I didn't perceive him to be uh, in, in a situation of, of, that I was concerned about at that point. I, I, I thought we were business as usual and that we would end up doing the, what we had to do uh, to deal with the, that particular problem. So that's what I can tell you. Uh, that's what I told the investigators at the time. Um, and um, that's what I know. The L3 was not a topic of discussion between him and, and me at all. And Gary, with, with regard to a deal like the L3 deal in, in Cooper's practice, would that be something well, that John could do on his own? No, anyway? I mean, this, this would, have, would have been a multi-million dollar commitment over a several year period of time that would have been uh, gone through the finance committee and then to the, ultimately to the board of trustees to pass on it. It was just too big a deal uh, that to be done by, uh, uh, you know, a, a signature by a, by a member of, of management. So that was, there was no question that would have ended up having to go as the ultimate L3 deal did uh, to, the, to the full board for approval. Dan? So are you, so, are you saying- know that we all, right? Yes. Are you saying, Mr. Lesneski, that you believe that that John Sheridan was so upset about the problems in the cardiology department that he somehow lost his mind and killed his wife and killed himself? That's a hundred percent not what I told the investigators. They they came to the office and were asking questions about his state of mind. It was pretty clear that that was their that was their uh, frame of reference at the time. So I honestly told him that he was agitated and, and upset over this whole cardiology problem. But I told them 100% that we left that Friday, everything was in order, that there was no, uh, nothing that would suggest that his behavior uh, would uh, result in, in any type of, of violent action. I thought it was unimaginable. And to this day, I will tell you, it's unimaginable to me that that could have happened. That was not the John Sheridan we knew and loved, and it was not the John Sheridan that left that I, that left his office on that Friday afternoon, evening, um, prepared for a very important meeting on Sunday. Not just doesn't make any sense to me. It never made any sense then. But I was honest with the investigators, as I think was 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 appropriate to tell them, uh, you know, a, about what uh, you know. The, the level of interactions we had with John and what was on his mind at the time, at least as was communicated to me. But Nancy, actually, I just want to follow up on one quick thing that Gary said, because he referenced the investigators in the comments. And, you know, because part of this is if you're going to prove that A happened and B didn't, that the official explanation is not correct. I was wondering whether you had been able to obtain access to the investigation itself and the notes when they interviewed everybody who was dealing with John in the final days. And that goes back a little bit to what Bill was asking about in terms of, you know, it, in, until recently, we don't know that we've been we've been unaware of any contacts you'd had with any Cooper people in the, you, you know, about the death of the Sheridans. You referenced reaching out to Mazzarelli three years ago. Presumably that was about L3 and not the death of John Sheridan, although correct me if I'm wrong. 
But did you did you have access to the investigative materials? And did you reach out to anybody at Cooper about John's sort of state of mind, actions, activities in the final weeks and months at Cooper, not other people, but at Cooper? Yeah. And and, well, and, well, and Nancy, well, wait, Nancy, just this is Bob. Just to to put a fine point on what Dan was saying, based on your your just your recent response to Bill uh, Tambusi, you can't possibly be equating your lack of reaching out to Cooper folks for this story or podcast from their lack of response to you on something else three years ago. I mean, I, you're not you're not telling us that because. They didn't get back to you three years ago. You didn't bother to call them now. That's that. That can't be what you're trying to intimate. Um, no, it, but it. My questions in 2019 were about the same thing. So it's not, about it's the not death of one story and then another story. It's it's essentially the same story. I'm sorry. So, Nancy, they were about uh, John's state of mind in the final weeks. Mm -hmm. Nancy, I don't want to keep peppering you. But when, when you were in 2019, those questions? That's yes. what you intended to ask them? Yes. And I spoke with all of you about the L3 deal in 2019. You did not, Nancy, you were dealing with me at that time. You did not ask me about John Sheridan's state of mind at that time. And we did and, most and of to clarify, Nancy, Nancy, you and I, just to, to, to agree with Dan, you and I were talking at the same time about L3. You never, ever, ever brought up John Sheridan to me. So, so, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hard pressed to believe that you well, were say, calling. The, pers the person I was trying to reach most uh, kind of aggressively was Douglas Shirley because he was on all the emails uh, that I had copies of. Uh, so but that wouldn't have had anything to, to do with John's state of mind. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. That wouldn't have had anything to do with John's state of mind. The question is, and this is, I, I think, the fundamental thing that Mike was getting to at the beginning, which is that you said that this was an investigation into the deaths of the Sheridans, and you were disproving the official explanation, which is in dispute, and proving that there was a murder. And we were asking you whether you spoke to anyone to to how you disproved the official investigation, which is one of the ways would presumably have been to speaking to people who are dealing with him on a day-to-day -day basis. When we asked you those questions, you said, three years ago, I called some people. They didn't return my phone call. I guess I'm asking you one more time. Did you speak to people in 2019 about John's state of mind? Because certainly you did not in when discussions with me or with Bob, and most of our communications were in writing. So did you have access to the investigative material? And did you speak to people in 2019 about a state of mind? And if not, how can you disprove what's, you know, don't, do you, do you have any concerns that trying to disprove something that was based on a state of mind when you didn't talk to any of the people who were dealing with him? Well, here, here we are. And I'm happy to hear what you have to say about his state of mind. I think that's what we're talking about. Um, and that's why <laughs> well, we not the the just said we, talk, we tried to call people three years ago. Yeah. Look, I was I was likely the last person to see John Sheridan that Friday before he left the home. And I and you know, so I I, I can tell you and I have told you what the what are the nature of our discussions were at that time. Um uh, I did not think I, that he a person was leaving the, the, the health system who was not in control of himself. Uh, Quite the contrary. I thought it was he was ready to to deal with this this cardiac issue on Sunday, and we were um, raring to go. And he had just written a very cogent, coherent explanation to a request from George Norcross about the potential for aid related to, to Hurricane or Storm Sandy. I mean, so I mean the evidence yeah, is plain. I, 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 we don't disagree, gentlemen. We don't disagree. Okay. I do not believe that John Sheridan was in a murderous state of mind in September 2014. Uh, so I'm not quite sure what we're arguing about. 
because no, we're not. I'm not arguing with you. I'm just. I, I, this is the. I know you had tried to call me, Nancy, uh, a, a day or two before what was previously going to be the phone call. So I knew you wanted to talk to me, but uh, I, I didn't get back to you because we were scheduled for a call, like you know, a day later. So I, uh, I. So I'm just telling you what I know. I'm happy to answer any other questions about it. But that's. I thought you wanted to talk to me because you, you did call me. And, yeah, and, 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 yeah, no, so and I'm, 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 get involved in this. If we're in agreement that John Sheridan leaves Cooper on that Friday ahead of time, thinking about focused upon the cardiac issues, but in a, a decent state of mind and had just spoken with George Norcross via email. I don't understand how you make the leap to some of the, some of the issues that you raise in your April 14th letter that are either six years, Farris case, two years, Corral case, five years after, Dranoff case, to George Norcross. It doesn't make any sense. Well, Bill, can I, I, what we're trying to say, I guess, Nancy, and I think I tried to say at the beginning, I mean, the comments you're making and the speculation you're looking to draw, and I use the word speculation, is more appropriate for a reality TV show. That, that's what they live off of speculation, not truth, just speculation. But for a responsible, award-winning journalist as yourself, if this is a piece of journalism, I know you can't go with what you're going with. Now, if you're going to say, wait a second, this is not journalism. This is New York Times versus Sullivan type of issue. This is really commercial enterprise. And really, it's akin to a reality TV show. Then, then there are no boundaries. But I have more respect for you. And I have more respect for WNYC that you would not engage in speculation. And what we're trying to say, and it keep comes back to, I use the word journalistic fairness. I mean, I would imagine, I don't even know how many podcasts you already have in the can. I don't know how you're going to do. I mean, you may have already completed your series. And so late in the game, you're coming to the people who had dealings with John Sheridan at the time of his unfortunate death. Now, three and a half years later, after you're already into I don't know if you're eighty percent complete, ninety percent complete, or one hundred. Let me answer that. Let me answer that, Mike. Uh, sure. We are not. Com we have not completed the episodes. Uh, All right. And we reached out to you on April fourteenth, and I I realize that you're annoyed about not being given more time. I apologize, but that's kind of you know how these things come together. Um, we reached out to you with the full intention of getting answers to the questions and working those into the episodes and we still can and that's why we're having this call is because we want to hear what you have to say and we're recording it and we will put it in the episodes so um, and Nancy, can i just follow up on what you're yes. saying if you're not finished then i hope you repeat on a podcast what you said to uh, David first on April 25, 22. After your words, you've been involved in this investigation to crack a murder, which you thought you could solve for over two years. And I want you to repeat what you said to David first in your podcast, that I haven't found any evidence that George Norquist had anything to do with the death of the Sheridans. And if that is an accurate premise, what you said then, which it is now, I don't know what George Norcross has to do with this story, except you want to just bring a politician into, quote, your description of a political murder. I've not heard of a, quote, political murder. But when you're talking about political murder and you emphasize one politician, the only linkage people could draw is you're trying to suggest that George Norcross directly and indirectly had something to do with the tragic death of the Sheridan. So I'm asking you, please, the next podcast you do, make clear that you have no evidence after two years of investigation that George Norquist had anything to do with the unfortunate and tragic death of John and Joyce Sheridan. That's journalistic fairness. If it's not, then it's a reality TV show and we're off on a different tangent if that's the case. Okay. I, I'm here. I hear you. I am listening. I hear you. And um, I'm glad we're having this conversation. Sure. Um, you know, you're, you're, when you say that George Nor, you know that that this this story and the you know that there's nothing in the narrative that has anything to do with George Norcross. Uh, that's why we're asking about the L three deal, and that's why we're we're you know because those are the documents okay. that were Nancy, left on okay. the Sheridan dining room table now, the night that he died. 
Nancy, if this had to do, if your podcast was an analysis of the L3 deal, that's fine. But you're talking about the analysis of a political murder. The L3 deal has nothing to do with the murder, nothing to do with George, George Norcross. My concern is that L3 may be relevant to another podcast. But when you say there's no evidence linking George Norcross to the death, unfortunate death, and I keep saying that, the unfortunate death and tragedy of John and Joyce Sheridan, that's where you've gone too far. Okay, and I, I understand. Have, have maybe, and, and Nancy, maybe, and Nancy, I'm sorry, Nancy, you, you, I'm not sure you had this information before this call, but you now know that John Sheridan acknowledged that he had a conflict in July, on July 9th of 2014. And he certified that to Cooper. Can you send me that document? And, and, and I just want to clarify some bills. Can, yes. can we get a commitment that you on the podcast repeat what you said to your colleague, David, first, that there is no evidence involving George Norcross with the death of Joyce and John Sheridan? I mean, we talked about it, but you didn't say you're going to do what I think is journalistically fair and to not, not create the tease of a connection cleverly, but clearly and directly, which, which a journalistic integrity would require. After two years, there's no evidence linking George Norcross to uh, the death of John and Joyce Sheridan. Because, you know, you were talking about L3. I mean, you're trying to, and I, I saw some of the emails, you're, you know, when you send, you advertise this, I think one of the emails you send out, I think went out on April 26, you were telling people, I want you to listen because sub subscribing, giving a five-star review or leaving a written review. So you're asking for, for reviews. That's fine. That's marketing. But you cannot utilize marketing to involve George Norcross to market this, this case. Because if you just did a podcast on L3, no one would listen. And the speculation and the provocative allegations against people involved. I mean, I'm not, I'm not here to defend. I'm not here to defend anyone except George Norcross because I think it's totally unfair but, you know, what I listened to so far, I mean, you've criticized the competence and competence of the Somerset County Prosecutor's Office. That's on their own. They, you know, do. I listened to it. And there's obviously questions about how they handled it. And then you try to suggest directly, indirectly, that the attorney general's office is somehow corrupt. You know, that's, that may be, they may not be. I'm not here to defend them. But all I want to do is when it comes to George Norcross, you please state on the record that George Norcross, based upon your intensive investigation and all the people you've spoken to, you've spoken to law enforcement officers, law enforcement agencies, forensic experts, people of non John Sheridan, people who've dealt with John Sheridan, talk to John, and there's nothing to indicate one way or another, one way, there's nothing to indicate, period, that George Norcross has anything to do with the death of John and, and Joyce Sheridan. Can I get that commitment from you, please? Because I think that's what I'm You could get a commitment from me that I will do my utmost to be as fair and accurate and truthful as possible. These are, you know, these are editorial decisions and we we're working as a team. So, you well, know, well, how I it gets said and what gets said will be, we'll have to decide. But the point of this meeting is to listen to what you have to say and to incorporate that into the scripts of the podcast. So yes, we are listening to you and we are, it's our, intention to be fair and accurate well, and I, I would love to hear from mr norcross right now well, I, tell but, me tell me about the the this conflict over the l3 building and whether or not that was causing stress in your relationship with mr sheridan and 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 you know let let's hear about it yeah can i before you go there i know you're trying to divert i just want to what's inaccurate about me asking you to say you have no evidence that george norquist had anything to do I, with the, i with didn't the say truth. there was anything inaccurate i'm just okay. saying we i will i pledging to you i will do my best to be as fair as possible and be as accurate as possible that is what i strive to do okay, that's but I want all to, i'm saying and i appreciate that what you're talking about here your your title to the podcast is not a New Jersey murder. Your podcast is New Jersey political murder. And you're focusing on one quote politician, in your words, that's George Norcross. And all I'm saying to you is this is not speculation. It's a statement you made directly just two weeks ago. I'm not asking something you said historically. You said two weeks ago in marketing this podcast, that David, that you have no evidence whatsoever that George Norcross had anything to do with the death of Joyce and John Sheridan. Now, why you are equivocating 
on giving me a commitment that you will put that in a podcast causes me again to be more curious to using the mission statement of uh, WNYC, more curious as to what the motive is behind this article. If you cannot give me that simple commitment, that seems to me that goes to your, to your my evaluation of whether this is journal, journalistically fair. And if you can't give me that commitment, I question whether George Norcourt should have anything to say, because that's a basic, that's the fundamental question of your, the fundamental premise of your podcast. Who killed jo uh, Joyce and John Sheridan? And you said you're going to crack it. Now, I hope you do crack it. And I assuming when you're going to crack it, you're going to say, guess what? I've, I've solved this and George Norcourt had nothing to do with it. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, you may get an apology offered to George Norcourt for suggesting, intimating that he had something to do with it. Because if we can't get that from you, Nancy, how can we have any faith in you're going to be fair? Even though you say, oh, I'm going to go to my editors. I mean, that's just buffers. I'm dealing with you. You're the producer. You're the award-winning uh, broadcaster. Why can't you give me that commitment? Because I, I, I'm not going to commit to exact words. I'm telling you but that I'm words. listening. Your and words. We will... I'm asking you to repeat your words. I'm asking you to repeat nothing more than your words to your colleague on April 26th. I don't want okay. you to add anything. Don't add right, You've made your point. You've made your point, yeah, and, and I've given you my answer. I would love to hear from Mr. Norcross about this. You know. no, I, I, I agree with Mike. If, you're, if, if that's the commitment you're giving, I, I, it's my strong advice that, that George does not need to comment at this point in time because you have nothing, nothing, nothing that connects George Norcross to this matter whatsoever. Uh, and you have nothing that connects George Norcross to any, any issue of, of the murder of John and Joyce Sheridan. So it, it, why, can't, why, why can't we get that simple commitment to use your words? I'm not asking you to change a sentence, a comma, a colon. Just repeat your words. And I'll repeat. I, I have again. nothing more to add. I've answered you and I have nothing okay. more to add. And that, what, does I, that, what does that tell me about your fairness, Nancy? What does that tell me about your journalistic fairness and your bias, how you're writing this article? If you cannot even repeat on a podcast what you said in a marketing in a marketing interview to broadcast your podcast. Am I being unreasonable? Oh, man. I'm not I'm saying answering. you're being unreasonable. I've said Nancy, you, I've answered you the best better. I can answer Nancy, you. Nancy, you're better than this. You are better than this. You are, it doesn't yeah, fit the conclusion, but you're better than this, Nancy. I, I think that we can be finished. Yeah, um, and listen, I, you know, what I've said to you is we're, we're taking everything you're telling us under consideration. Uh, you know, the process of writing a script that gets broadcast, it's a, it's a kind of a complicated, long process. We parse the words, we go over it, we, you know, so I'm just saying, we'll take it under consideration. Uh, you know, there's, and Mr. Norcross is not the only person in the podcast connected to politics here. There's, you know, attorney generals, there's governors, it's, and well, we're listening and we'd like to hear everything you have to say. Well, you, you've heard what I have to say. And I don't, I just, if, if you're not going to give me that commitment, I would recommend we terminate this proceeding. It's other than that, it's just a waste of time. I, I think we're finished. I mean, we, we, we clearly gave you all the information that we have. We gave you access to the person who was with John Sheridan last in a professional way. Um, we, we gave you access to documents and information that we have in front of us that we will send to you and share to you, share with you. Um, we gave you the timeline. Uh, I, I think that we've been more than forthcoming. And all we're asking you to do is repeat the words you already said. And then and you can't you can't even give us that, that commitment. Okay. So Thank you. Thank you for the time. And um, we'll get back to you. If you if you change your mind, let us know, Nancy. OK, fellas. I'm, I'm, bye bye, guys. I'm, I'm gone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Emily, maybe we should meet on your Zoom call. Yeah, I was going to say we, I could do it. Yeah. Let's, Nancy, you'll do the recording thing.
stop that. Make sure oh, that yeah. we have that. Yeah. 